same spot every time. This week on Kentucky Field, we're catching black crappie. Look at there. Cooking. Oh yeah, these are done. And eating fish. Give it a try and tell me what you think. Then we're going to help you become a little better at that first part, which was catching fish with Baitcaster 101. Now we're going to demonstrate the five casts that I use most frequently when throwing a baitcaster. It's all next on Kentucky Afield. Such a pretty fish. Beautiful. This pond is plum loaded with frogs. They're everywhere in here. <laughs> Yeah, this is a good fish right here. Really good fish. Come here, girl. Hey, boy. That's a big rabbit. Nice job. Yes! Yes! <laughs> My first musket. <laughs> first Saint Leo. Yeah, we're here to get the keeper. Here it goes. Boom! Oh, oh. Nice. oh! Wow, that happened. Hello, and welcome to Kentucky Field. I'm your host, Chad Miles. Join us as we journey the Commonwealth in search of outdoor adventure. As you can tell, we're out here turkey hunting, but that's about to wind down. And if you're interested in learning more about fishing this year, well, this show's for you. Today should be a lot of fun. I'm out here with my brother-in-law, Larry Rogers, and I have been hearing about this pond that he's been fishing for the last couple years and how many crappie are in this pond. And this pond is, I don't know how many acres, I'm gonna guess six, seven acres. Mm -hmm. It's kind of small to have crappie in it, but you said it's got a heavy population of crappie. Very heavy population, uh, both black and white crappie. Um, last year we saw around this time of year, they really started coming up to the banks, very active. You get a few bass, some big bluegills in the mix. I go out with biologists and they'll always tell people, hey, if you're in a pond this size, try not to have white crappie because they will take over. And you're starting to see a, some hints of fish being stunted a little bit. Mm -hmm. A perfect way to handle that? Get a rod and reel. Let's fill a skillet. What do you think? Let's have some fun. Let's make it happen. Let's go. <laughs> what we got here? Oh, that's a large mouth. A small one, but it's a large mouth. I don't believe uh, this one, well, first off, it's not 12 inches, and second, I don't have the heart to put a knife to a large mouth. <laughs> <laughs> it needs to grow up a little bit. Yeah. Man, look at that bluegill. <laughs> that's a good, that's a pretty good sized bluegill. Look at that, bigger than my hand. There's one. What you got there? Looks like another bluegill. Man, look at that. We were out here trying to catch a mess of crappie, but bluegill, it doesn't get any better than that. We end up keeping a couple of these. There's one. Got one? Looks like a bluegill. Oh my, look at that. There's no reason not <laughs> be tickled to death to come out here and catch bluegill that size. They're hungry, that's for sure. We're just catching bluegill and bass, and that's a great thing. But let's walk around and see if we can't locate a pocket of crappie and hopefully put a couple in the cooler. Sounds great. Oh, another big bluegill. Look at that. Man, I'll tell you one thing. I can't believe how many bluegill we're catching just throwing these little crappie magnet jigs. And the bluegill are out there 10, 12 feet of water. Bluegill are probably a month from building their nest, but that doesn't mean that they're not hungry and ready to eat. Another bluegill. Same spot every time. What do we got here? What do we got uh -oh. here? Wait a minute. You broke the ice. Now look what you got, a crappie. Found one. Now was that thing further off the bank? Or? It was out there. It's probably about 15 feet off the bank. There's another one. That was a little bit nicer. Got some size to them. There you go. Uh-oh, you see that thing burn and drag for a second? We got a crappie here, I hope. It's a nice one. Black crappie, look at there. Probably about 10 inches or so. I could tell something was a little different when that one hit. That's a pretty fish. I tell you what, black crappie, 
They're so incredibly beautiful. And when they get a little bit of thickness in that back, there's nothing better to eat than that right there. Looks like a bluegill. Nice bluegill. Dang gone. Big boy. That is a big one. Uh-oh, we may have a crappie. It may be a bass. Oh, oh my gosh. Bluegill. I, I've been tricked by a bluegill thinking it was a crappie because it was burning my drag. Tell you what, you know you got a healthy population of really big bluegill when you come out here with little swim baits that I a lot of times catch white bass on or I crappie fish with, and you catch a big bluegill on every cast. <laughs> If it looks like we're catching fish on every cast, it's because we're catching fish on almost every cast. <laughs> but that's not normally the case. We come out here, we might film all day and get 20 good bites. But here, no, it's every cast. Looks <laughs> like I got his little brother. <laughs> you sure do. Not exactly what we're looking for, but. <laughs> Trick photography. Look at this beast! Oh my gosh. No, no, not really. <laughs> Good one there. Well, Larry, I'll tell you what, what a heck of a day. Great day. I mean, I don't know how many fish we caught, but we decided after catching, I don't know how many of these and throwing them back, wait a minute, my kids have been on my case for the last year about bringing home some fish to eat, and boy, we put the hammer to them. We did, great day out here. <laughs> Good fishing. Thanks for having me. Well, spring is the time of year that I catch myself bringing home a lot of fish. My kids are always on me, Dad, bring home some fresh fish. So I've tried to find new creative ways to make dishes that are healthy that my kids will really, really like. Fish is really, really good fried, everybody knows that, but it's a little bit of work and it can be a lot of cleanup. And obviously we'd like to have more healthy options. So what I'm gonna do today is showcase a, a dish that really can be made, prepared the whole nine yards and clean up in about 20 minutes. What we're gonna to do today is gonna to be just a fish dish over rice. And obviously, if you're gonna make this dish, you're gonna start out by doing your rice first because it's gonna take some time to boil this. You know, any type of white rice will work for this. I like jasmine or basmati rice because it really tends to hold the flavor of the fish. It's really mild and it holds that flavor very well. I'll be honest with you, my kids can't tell the difference. And for simplicity and time, I'm going the 90 second version and we're gonna get this ready here in just a minute. But first, let's get our hands washed and get the fish seasoned and we're gonna get them on the grill. All right, first thing we're gonna do is we're going to melt some butter. So you can use any kind of butter. I actually like the, the taste of this butter that's got garlic, Parmesan, and basil in it. I mean, how can you go wrong with that on fish, right? So we're gonna take some of this and we're gonna get it in a cup and melt it in the microwave. So we're gonna put it in this coffee mug here. That'll probably be good. And we'll keep that spoon because I'm gonna use it again later on. Put this in the microwave for 20 seconds and we'll get ready. Now I'm gonna take my fish, I'm gonna lay them out on a pan here with some aluminum foil. And I'm gonna lay my fish out here in single layer, drizzle some of the butter over it, and I'm gonna put some seasoning on it. We're gonna keep the seasoning super simple. Probably my favorite seasoning for all types of wild game and fish is this Greek seasoning called Cavendeers. It can be found about anywhere. And then of course, this little Creole Cajun shake style seasoning. Can't go wrong with a little bit of this. So these are gonna be the main two ingredients on top of the butter that already has a little bit of garlic and Parmesan and basil in it. We're gonna put these on the grill at 425 degrees, and then we're gonna put it over a bed of rice. Kids love this dish, and it keeps all the mess outside, and really, super simple. All right, so let's lay our fish out. These are all crappie and bluegill that were recently caught. I worry about them slipping through the grill or drying out a little bit, so I like to put them on aluminum foil. Now we're gonna take this butter that we've melted in the microwave, 
Just gonna pour a little bit of this on it. It kind of helps it keep from sticking too. And then when this is all done, I'm gonna use a little bit of this reduced butter and mix it in with the rice. It really makes it delicious. I'm gonna wash my hands one more time. I'm gonna start off good old faithful Cavan Deers. I'm gonna give it a pretty generous coat. All right, now I'm gonna come back with some of this Creole seasoning and do the same thing. Now, that is pretty much ready to go. I like a little smokiness on mine, so I use a little bit of this, which uh, is a fishmonger. I'll put a little bit of this on a couple pieces I plan on eating. It gives just a little bit of smokiness that I think is great on fish. The grill's already hot. Let's get these on the grill for eight to 10 minutes. Should be ready to go. Let's get these fillets out of this pan and I'm just gonna leave the aluminum foil right on the grill. Now's the time to go, since I'm doing ready rice, pop that in the microwave and get it ready. Come back down, everything should be set and ready to go. Literally 10 minutes from the time this hits the grill, we're eating. Well, these are pretty thin fillets. It's been about eight minutes. Let's check them out. They smell like they're getting close. Oh yeah, these are done. Let's get the heat cut off, get the fillets back on the pan, and get them up ready to serve. And there's no mess on the grill either. We've kept any frying out of the house. Kids are eating healthy. Total of 15 minute prep time. We're ready. Gonna get these bowls, put a little bit of rice on the bottom. And then from here, I'm gonna take this spoon and take just a little bit of this butter and seasoning that was on this fish. Put that here on the bottom on this rice. Mix it in real good. Now, put the fish on. All right, let's get the kids. All right, you guys ready? Yes. I don't have any veggies right now, but give it a try and tell me what you think. Well, what do you guys think? It's good. You like it? If you're looking to gain additional cast accuracy with your rod and reel, Learning how to set up your bait caster effectively may be your first step. Today we're going to talk about one of my absolute favorite topics, and that is fishing reels. Now this here is your traditional bait casting fishing reel, low profile reel. This is the rod and reel setup that I use on about 80% of all bass fishing. I have friends all the time call me up and say, hey, I, I wanna buy a new rod and reel, what do you recommend? And this is what I'm typically gonna recommend if you're not pan fishing. A lot of my friends say, hey, I only throw a spinning reel. And every time I've ever tried to throw a bait caster, I've had nothing but problems. But what I'm telling you is if you match your rod, your reel, your line, and your lure weight, and they all match, these can be highly, highly efficient tools and you get way more control out of throwing a bait caster than you can ever get out of throwing a spinning reel. I'm gonna demonstrate a little bit of that later. But first off, if you're just getting into bass fishing or you've been bass fishing and you don't use a bait caster and you're thinking about picking one up, I would go with a six foot six, medium to medium heavy rod and I'd, I'd err to the lighter end of that and make sure that when you read the rod, it will tell you what weight lure and what weight line to throw on it and it'll give you a range. This particular one here says 5 16 ounce lure to 3 quarters of an ounce. All right, I'm throwing a 5 16 ounce, ounce jig right here. It will also tell you the pound test. This says 14 to 20 pound test. On a medium weight rod, this is medium heavy, you're gonna get somewhere between eight to 16 pound. Throw the lightest line that you can to learn how to cast one of these. You'll get more distance and they're easier to throw. Also recommend, I love throwing fluorocarbon line in a situation like this where it's all about touch and feel, but learn how to throw a bait caster using monofilament. It's easier to throw and when you get a bird's nest and you have to take that line out, it's not as hard on your pocketbook. So once you get that set up, there are really two things that two levels of adjustment on these reels other than your drag. 
And the first one is called your cast control knob. Every single reel manufacturer will have a knob on there that's called your cast control. And it's usually set right here by the crank, real close to the drag. What you wanna do is tighten this knob down and then push the button on your reel to allow the line to spool out freely. And as you can see, it's locked down. That is not going anywhere. Once you get it set that, to that point right there, you wanna start opening it up until the, until the bait starts to fall with a bit of a stop and start motion. That means that your reel is now set where you want it to be set. Now, as you become more proficient throwing a bait caster, you may find that you wanna really open it up and make it really loose and do what they call feathering the line. You're still gonna have to feather it when you cast it like this, but you can get more distance by throwing it, casting the rod, and, a, and putting your thumb on the line and putting a little bit of tension on it. The second level of adjustment on these reels is called your brake control. And they are located in different areas depending on the brand and the model of reel you're throwing. This one is right here on the bottom and it has numbers one through five. Five meaning it's putting the most tension and it, it will reduce your backlashes, but it will also reduce your casting distance, one being almost completely free. And you'll find those located in different areas and I'll showcase that here in a little bit. So now I've got my reel set up. We're about ready to start making some casting. Now we're gonna demonstrate the five casts that I use most frequently when throwing a bait caster. First off is you know the long overhead bomb cast. This is one that you're making in open water, you're trying to make really long cast. Sometimes it might be a crankbait, might be a swim bait, maybe a spinner bait. This is the style of cast that typically you're gonna turn the reel over on its side, engage the spool, come straight back over your head and make a long cast out. Now, as that bait's going out there, you're gonna to want to keep a little bit of tension on the spool. You can feel the spool spinning under your thumb. And when it gets close to your intended target about where you wanna go, right before this water, you just lightly touch it and hold it, and then you'll switch hands and start your retrieve. Most important thing, and what I see where a lot of people mess up on this is one of two things. They either don't match their weight to their lure and their line, or when they go to make the cast, they either don't have enough line hanging down or they have too much line hanging down. You're really looking for somewhere in the range of about 18 to 24 inches. If you don't have enough line hanging down, when you go back to cast, you don't have enough force to load your rod tip to get the distance. And if you have too much line, when you go back to make a cast, you got this long whipping action. You want that, you want that bait going as fast as it can, pulling line from the spool and not making a big loop. This is about the distance that you're looking for right here. The biggest mistake I see is where people try to cast too close or too far away. This is also, if you're fishing out of a boat, a really good cast to, to know because if you're fishing two or three people side by side, you're always casting straight behind you and straight out. You don't have to worry about hooking someone. Now let's talk about the next cast. The next cast is a sidearm cast. A sidearm cast, you'll see people a lot of times use it off the front of the boat or if they're just fishing two people, you'll see them make this style of a cast. Kind of come through the side and throw that lure right on out there. On this one, you're right, you're, usually your spool is facing straight up and down as opposed to the, to the overhead cast where you tilt it to the side. But other than that, the distance that you're letting the lure hang down is still really important. This is the kind of cast you're just gonna kind of sidearm rip it out there. Exact same thing, I'm feathering it, touching it right when I want it, when I want it to stop to keep from any, any overrun. If I get out in a situation where I'm fishing down a bank and I'm, I'm making somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 yard cast, 30 yard cast, this is the cast that I will use quite often at that point in time. Not quite the distance that I'm getting with the overhead cast, but still really effective cast. For our next cast, I'm gonna move to the other side of the boat and this is a cast I use quite often if I'm casting over the front side of the boat or if you're fishing from the bank, if you have some trees that are hanging down, this is a really good cast, and I call this my underhand roll cast. And this is a cast where you take the rod and you make a loop and you cast it almost on the plane of the water and you cast it out. This is also the cast that I use when I go to docks and I wanna skip a bait. This takes a little bit of practice and you gotta get your control just right. It's not a way to start, but if you wanna roll a cast out there, 
right on the water level and you can literally get the bait to skip right up under a dock. Great technique on sunny days for catching largemouth bass. But this underhand roll cast can be really, really effective and it's also a way on a really windy day to keep the bait low to the water and make accurate casts. If I'm throwing a spinner bait on a windy day, a lot of times this is what I'm throwing. The underhand roll cast is very similar. It starts out like an over the head cast, but you literally roll the bait under and you throw it right to your intended target. Let me demonstrate. You can be very accurate throwing this particular technique. And then what I really like about it is if I'm running the trolling motor and we're fishing this way on a bank and I have other people in the boat, I can, I can throw cast all day long right over the nose of the boat and not have to worry about anyone to this side of me. Flipping and pitching is a technique that you're gonna to use to fish very accurately. You wanna cast right into a piece of structure in shallow water and not make a big splash. The first technique is what I use for a little bit longer distance and it's the technique I use the most and it's called pitching. Now with pitching, the lure typically starts in your hand and you will literally bend the rod tip a little bit, load it up, and then essentially from there it's an underhand roll cast. Underhand roll it right to your target, feathering your bait, throw it harder than, it, than you need to get to get the bait there and then you stop it once you're close. I'll show you how to do this. Now one thing that's really important when you're flipping and pitching is as soon as that bait hits the water, change and engage your drag system because a lot of times you're pitching right where you think the fish is there and if it hits as a reaction bite and you go to set the hook before you've engaged your spool and you set the hook, <laughs> you've got yourself a bird's nest. The last cast I want to show is for the absolute closest, most precise cast and this is called flipping. Now on flipping, you're literally going to take your Take your rod and you're going to pull some line off your spool. You're going to gently lay a bait and on this here you're usually only casting less than 10 feet. So I'm taking this here and I'm going to gently lay it out there and then I'm going to engage my spool and I'm going to work a very specific spot. Maybe it's a stump, maybe it's a stick up. If you are still not convinced that a bait caster is right for you or you've tried one before and you've not had good results, there is some technology out here that you might want to know about. And this is called DC for digital control. Now this has a bunch of magnets in there like all the, all the reels do, but what these magnets do is they almost act like an anti-lock braking system on your car. If the spool goes too free, which essentially allows you to get the overrun, this thing will slow it down and will allow you, once you set the, the reel up like we've done all the others, and we want to add, add the brake, hit the button, let the slow fall, tune this thing back to around one or two, you can start making cast. You don't even have to touch the spool. I know that sounds crazy. I'm gonna demonstrate a cast. I'm gonna throw a 40 yard cast. I'm not gonna to touch the spool in flight, and I'm not gonna to touch the spool when it hits the water. And watch this. Not one loop, zero overrun whatsoever. Again, this technology has been out for about five or six years, but it's just recently been offered in reels that are affordable. Fishing with a bait caster can add so much additional control and accuracy to your lure presentation. If you do not use a bait caster, you really need to think about picking one up and giving it a try. Now let's check in and see who else has been out having fun in this week's Ones That Didn't Get Away. Check out this beautiful photo of a father and son double in the opening day of the turkey season in LaRue County. Here we have Warner Bryan and his dad, Joe. Congratulations. Here we have 11-year-old Hudson Kersey who got his very first turkey on the opening day in Henryville, Indiana. Nice job. Baron Bradshaw of Bergen, Kentucky caught this nice bass while fishing at Cedar Creek. He was fishing a minnow under a bobber. Nice job. Check out this nice limit of white bass that was caught at Bacon Creek on Nolan Lake. These were caught by Kevin Large and Charlie Gibbs of E-Town and Lewis Graham of White Mills, Kentucky. Here we have a beautiful picture of a really nice buck taken by eight-year-old Peyton Elizabeth Venom. This deer was taken in Meade County, Kentucky and it's her first big buck. Congratulations. 
Here we have Larry Bacon with a really nice black crappie that was caught at his friend's farm pond. Nice fish. Here we have a really nice buck that was taken by six-year-old Lacey Sorrel. This deer was taken on a family farm in Montgomery County, Kentucky. Check out this beautiful big tom that was taken by J.R. Moore while hunting in eastern Kentucky. Just a friendly reminder, if you're a boat owner, your boat registration expires soon. And remember, hunting and fishing on private property is a privilege. Always ask permission and thank the landowner. Until next week, I'm your host, Chad Miles, and I hope to see you in the woods or on the water.